James Edward Newcomer was brought to us by John Franklin Newcomer and Mary Louise McConnell Newcomer on December 3rd, 1936. Jimmy was born in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and was the second of three sons, following Johnny by four years and preceding Ronnie by nine years. Jimmy was a fun-loving kid and a doting older brother to Ronnie. Throughout his life, he spent significant time with Ronnie and their parents, John and Louise, who supported all of their children through thick and thin. But Jimmy and Ronnie remained close throughout their lives, living in the same neighborhood as adults for the last 40 years. Jim even served as Ron's best man at Ron's wedding to his bride, Diane. Yes, even Jim knew the fashions of the 1970s were horrific. As a result of their lifelong bond, Jim served as the doting Uncle Jim to Ron and Diane's two children, Miles and Megan. In 1942, when Jimmy was five, the newcomer family moved to a town outside San Diego, California. Jimmy enrolled at Warner Hot Springs Elementary School, where his father was principal, and attended elementary school there until 1948. While at Warner, Jimmy joined the 4-H club, and for his 1947-1948 club project, he raised a doe rabbit. As 12-year-old Jimmy described it, My project of rabbit started November 27, 1947 and ended May 27, 1948. My rabbit is a young doe which always takes good care of her rabbits. She's had over seven litters. I got my doe about a year ago. We was going to kill her until I decided that I wanted to raise her for the 4-H club. I'm not for sure yet, but I might enter her in the San Diego Fair in Del Mar. Jimmy Newcomer, June 1st, 1948. While the family lived in Warner Hot Springs, and his father Frank was posted as commandant of Brown's Military Academy in San Diego, Jimmy met a few of the stars he had come to know watching movies at the local theater. He collected and saved the autographs from Paramount's comedian actor Victor Moore, Jack Carson, who had just played alongside Cary Grant in Warner Brothers' version of Arsenic and Old Lace, and his apparent favorite, Roy Rogers, and Trigger, too. Jimmy's love for the movies and the actors who crafted their on-screen performances would continue throughout his life, as anyone who knew him came to understand. Jimmy also collected and saved the autograph of World War II Admiral and Hero of the Pacific R.K. Kelly Turner, who he met through his father's military teaching post. At the end of the 1948 school year, the family moved again, this time to Tucson, Arizona. Jimmy became an outstanding student at Catalina Middle School, where, in 1951, as an eighth grader, Jimmy sang the role of the sergeant of police in the Pirates of Penzance, his first role as a performer. Jimmy concurrently participated in the Tucson Children's Theater program for the 1950-1951 season, then in its 20th year. Mary McMurtry, the TCT's director, so influenced Jim and so many other young actors that he joined hundreds of her alumni 20 years later in a grand testimonial dinner in honor of her 40 years of work and her role in setting Jimmy's own teaching career course in theater and directing. Jimmy graduated from the ninth grade junior high on June 2, 1952, and went on to Tucson High School. While at Tucson High, Jimmy pursued his dual passions of performance and speech and debate. As a performer, he appeared on the U of A stage for the first time as the ringmaster in the county fair, produced by the Tucson Dance Studio, as the Dancing Santa Claus in the school's annual Yuletide Festival, a production in which he also served as the narrator, a nod to his deep, melodious, baritone voice we all knew. That voice often thrust him into the position of master of ceremonies as well for many events on campus and throughout the community as when he performed that role for the Tucson Elks Lodge in its National Youth Day Observance in April 1955. But during his high school years, Jimmy was most noted for his speech and oratory skills. He participated actively throughout his high school years, reaching the state finals and besting all of his competition. Jim's work in speech and debate required him to hone his writing, which led him to serve on the school newspaper as well, and even a stint as a guest editorial writer for the Tucson Daily Citizen. He also wrote for the Tucson High Quarterly, a magazine format produced four times a year. Jim so influenced his fellow students as a writer that friends dubbed him Mr. Jimmy, This Is Your Life Newcomer for his biographical work, including a presentation Jimmy made to honor the student's beloved drama director, Danny Romero. 
Apparently, one of Mr. Romero's productions that had included Jimmy didn't go off so well. And Jimmy, feeling their mentor's pain imposed by a few parents, wrote a letter for the students in support of Mr. Romero. Jimmy saved Mr. Romero's response. After receiving four or five calls from parents calling me a failure, your letter gave me a new life. If I have done a good job, it has been because the parents have sent me good material to work with. Thanks again for your nice letter. Always, Danny Romero. His classmates further honored Jimmy as a junior by selecting him as one of the guards for the senior class's commencement in 1954. Jimmy graduated on May 31, 1955. James went on to college at the hometown University of Arizona. He continued his pursuit of speech and debate, taking frequent awards and prizes in university competitions. And with his deep, possessing, powerful voice, he even performed live readings. Dear Mr. Newcomer, we, the members of the Seroptimus International Club of Tucson, wish to thank you for appearing before our club and giving the entertaining reading. It was excellently given, and we enjoyed it very much. Thank you again. Leela M. Genwin, Corresponding Secretary, November 16, 1956. Jim's collegiate work at first focused on English language and speech courses, but with his focus on speech and diction and possessing that deep, powerful voice, Jim was confronted by the obvious opportunity, live theater performance. Jim was drawn to and succeeded in performing at U of A's student theater. Jim added significant courses in drama and theater-related classes in set design, writing, including for television, and other subjects that complemented his talents. He performed frequently at the U of A, and even went on the road directing and performing upstate in Mesa's Little Theater as Otto in Rapunzel and the Witch and his alm uncle in Heidi. Jim concluded his undergraduate program with a lead role and with directing and production responsibilities for the 16th century play The Summoning of Everyman, requiring Jim to design costumes and the set as well. After all that work in speech, oration, drama, and theater, Jim Newcomer graduated on June 1, 1960, with his Bachelor of Arts degree in education. James Newcomer had decided he would teach, but before settling down in that career, he took one last fling with live performance. He moved to Corning, New York, and joined the newly rechristened Corning Summer Theater, a repertory operation with a resident company. The resident company served as support to star performers brought into headline productions. These performers included Joan Fontaine, Dana Andrews, Sid Caesar, Gig Young, Myrna Loy, and others. The company produced 209 shows from 1953 to 1973, with James Newcomer numbering among the Corning summer casts in 1960, starring with Paul Ford. After returning to Arizona in the winter of 1960-61, he was cast in a Tucson Playbox Theater production of Two for the Seesaw. The play ran in May 1961, but Jim already was on to his next role. Jim was drawn to teach his craft to young people. On April 27, 1961, James Newcomer got his first teaching post, a full year in Prescott, Arizona teaching English. The pay, $4,500. That didn't last long. By then, Mr. Newcomer knew he really wanted to teach, and what he wanted to teach was theater. So he applied for new jobs, and landed one with the wildly growing Scottsdale School District on March 20, 1962, and awaited his assignment. He got it two days later, on March 22, 1962. He was assigned to the newly built Coronado High School, in what was then Central Scottsdale. He started in the newly created speech department, then Mr. Newcomer went about creating the theater program he really wanted to build. Mr. Newcomer was quickly placed in charge of the new school's student assemblies. These were student-produced programs that left Mr. Newcomer frustrated, but eager to improve them. They also caused him to show his demand that students learn professionalism in their theater production and performance. In a memo to fellow but senior teacher William Kelly, he wrote, The senior class has done a fine job this year preparing their assembly. However, I have a few suggestions regarding procedures. The students will not ask the faculty's advice or ask for help until the last minute, and this proves their inability to achieve a polished performance without a trained professional's help. When I spend a year training students for proper backstage and performance procedure, it is ludicrous to assume a group of inexperienced teenagers can absorb the necessary knowledge in one or two weeks. I am more than willing to do all I can to help, but I cannot do it alone. I would like to rectify the situation before it develops any further. 
Mr. Newcomer, Friday, December 13, 1963. Unknown to most students, Mr. Newcomer also went back to school at the same time. James re-enrolled in a master's degree program at his alma mater, U of A. While undertaking that effort to improve his mastery of theater craft and teaching, Mr. Newcomer worked to create his desired drama program. Mr. Newcomer used his third-hour class to cast and produce Coronado's first real live stage play. For it, he chose the satirical comedy, The Curious Savage. It was a sufficiently bold move that it even made the Scottsdale Progress, announcing the running dates as March 8th and 9th, 1963. The next fall, Mr. Newcomer tried again, this time mounting Gramercy Ghost on October 18th and 19th, 1963. Yes, Mr. Newcomer had succeeded in convincing the Coronado administration to renew his contract. What students at the time may not have known is that Mr. Newcomer was using his classroom work as his own education laboratory as he continued his education toward his master's degree. As part of that degree program, Mr. Newcomer completed a report for his coursework that gives us a glimpse of the ideas that would form the core of his teaching approach and philosophy and directly impact thousands of students. A copious self-appraisal of my work in Grammary Ghost seems to show it more distinguishable than my work in past shows. Just as an actor will logically develop skills, if properly guided, it seems a director, if observant, will necessarily improve his past errors. However, these improvements are not miracles. They are deliberate attempts to discipline and crystallize his craft. Last year, during the March 1963 production of The Curious Savage, I felt a need to strengthen my major characters. Gramercy Ghost was my second production. In between this past summer, I realized I have made a profession of a great love, the theater. It is no longer a toy, a means to exhibit J.E. Newcomer or device for self-glorification. It perhaps involves the most important thing I could possibly be concerned about. Young men and women striving to perfect an art. Boys and girls creating something with just an ideal as the raw material. Also, I felt this year a stronger insight into my personal development. I realize now that students do not want a friend. They want and must have a director. Gramercy Ghost is a beginning. Curious Savage was a lesson. I hope the ghost of Savage stays locked in my mind and only returns to haunt me when I fail to improve and or realize my mistakes. I know now to be satisfied with this profession is to be oblivious to its needs, its requirements, its rewards. James E. Newcomer, Director, Gramercy Ghost, Coronado High School, December 1963. Mr. Newcomer, with his students' perhaps unknown help, received his master's degree from the U of A in February 1965. Mr. Newcomer's drive to create the most professional of student theater programs is the legend most of us experienced. But even his fellow teachers and Coronado administrators understood and appreciated what Mr. Newcomer brought to his students in class and in the many extracurricular performances for which Mr. Newcomer took full personal responsibility. I find in Mr. Newcomer a person with dedication and devotion to his profession. In my visitation to his classes, it is obvious that he has great respect from the students. This has been brought on by his empathy towards his students, coupled with the noticeable fact that he knows his subject area. He has the ability to have students perform, express themselves, and relax in an atmosphere all the attributes that are necessary for a person working in the area of drama. He is demanding of his students, and he has a no-nonsense attitude about him when he is working, and he expects a great deal of his students. His contributions to Coronado High School have given this school a reputation of having one of the finest drama departments in Arizona. Additional comment, this is an exceptionally talented gentleman, a true asset to Coronado. Robert Hendricks, Principal, Coronado High School, February 11, 1974. In a Christmas card to his mother in the late 1970s, Mr. Newcomer wrote, Mama, this is the shot of my newest brood in the curtain call. I'm very proud of the set too. Jim, December 1978. Mr. Newcomer taught at Coronado High School from September 1962 to May 1993. In that time, he directed and produced more than 180 plays and musicals. In doing so, he worked with many talented artists who shared his passion for teaching theater as an art to young people. Gene Hansen was the founding musical director of Coronado's Bands, which meant he brought the orchestra to Mr. Newcomer's many musicals. 
Janie Jones, the accomplished principal dancer for George Balanchine, a lifelong Arizonan, provided the sophisticated choreography, with Rachel Ellis, Janie's mother, the costuming, and musicians like Norm Jensen and Priscilla Lightborn, herself a former student from the Coronado class of 1968, provided the rehearsal accompaniment. But if that weren't enough, Mr. Newcomer also staged summer musicals with high school students, community theater productions, both amateur and professional, and brought great theater performance to the Valley. And throughout his life, Newcomer had his constant companions, his dogs and cats. Anyone who knew Newcomer knew his affection for his furry friends, whether it was Hildegard the St. Bernard, his cats Azul and Pandora, Hannah the Golden Retriever, or Marilyn, his most recent four-legged friend to which Newcomer was completely devoted. Each and all of them could rely on him for support, comfort, and friendship, just as he could rely on them. On Hannah's passing, for example, Newcomer even wrote a letter celebrating this friend's life and passing. Hannah, a gregarious Golden Retriever, loved to share. Her unbreakable model for continuing happiness was to enjoy every minute of life with gratitude and spirited appreciation for the joys of generosity, devotion, and loyalty. For 12 years, we shared the excitement of swimming, uninhibited running, and spontaneous meetings with fellow Fido fanciers. I will always miss Hannah, but observing her final request, I've recently adopted Marilyn, a new breed. And everybody asks, what breed is it? With equally sensitive brown eyes who dictates that I throw the tennis ball so she can retrieve it. Jim Newcomer, May 30th, 2005. That was true for every one of us. We are so fond of Newcomer and so sorry for his loss, as much because each of us knew that we mattered to him, each and every one of us. He was in our corner, knew us better than most, pushed us to become our best selves, and he was proud of our work that created such results. Now today, each of us knows that we had at least one person who accepted us and who loved us for who we are.